So, hi, my name is Amber DiPietra. I'm a co-founder of the Disability and Sexuality Access Network. And we're trying this new feature where we sit down and have conversations, virtual conversations with folks who are part of DASAN, Disabled Sex Educators. Um, and today we have Bianca Loriano with us. Thanks for having me, hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at the wrong device. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, yes, and viewers, listeners, I'm visually impaired, so my access needs are that you just um, be patient with me while I scroll around with my uh, magnification software. Yeah, and I'm also happy to give an image description while you do that, if that would be helpful for you. Uh, well, we should probably give image descriptions anyways for Great. visually impaired viewers like myself. Um, I am physically disabled, uh, small, very short, dark hair, white passing um, woman with red lipstick on, and usually always black dress with some kind of print. Awesome. Hi, it's Bianca. I am a light-skinned Afro-Latina, and I have big curly hair that's like cascading. <laughs> past my shoulders. I'm wearing um, a black sleeveless dress and I have some really fun dark brown and black glasses on and I'm, I too am wearing red lipstick and I'm sitting in my office so you see a little bit of um, some degrees and some books and a window. Nice. Um, those are quite awesome glasses. Thank you. Okay so I'm just going to read uh, Bianca's bio for y'all, for the, for, for the listeners, viewers, y'all, that's what I would say. Yes. Bianca Loriano is an award-winning educator, curriculum writer, and sexologist. She is a co-foundress of Walkshin and Anti-Up, a virtual freedom school offering professional development and certification. Bianca has written several curricula, the Sexual and Reproductive Justice Discussion Guide for the NYCD HMH and is lead curriculum writer for the Netflix film Crip Camp, which is rooted in disability justice principles. And Bianca is, oh, the film is available at www.cripcamp.com and forward slash curriculum, you can find Bianca's curriculum. Bianca is an ASEC certified sexuality educator and supervisor and in May 2020 was awarded an honorary doctorate from the CIS for her work in expanding the US sexuality field. And then I will post Bianca's email um, and her website in the transcription that we're gonna have. Um, but it is Bianca Loriano, all one word, L-A-U-R-E-A-N-O.com is her website. Her organization is antiuppd.com. And you are uh, Latina sexuality, oh, Latino sexuality, at Latino sexuality. On Twitter. And do you not have an Instagram anymore, Bianca? I do have an Instagram. It's Latinegra Sexologist. So it's a really long name. Um, and there's a picture, there's a cartoon picture of me on there. Okay. And it's probably, yeah. yeah. So find it. That's what we have here. For some reason, the link is broken. We'll, we'll fix that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, quite. Um, can you help us unpack that? Because I, I went through college and that was very much a part of my life for a while, but I don't recognize all those certifications and degrees. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you know, the certification and degrees are definitely something that um, I got and then I started getting in the 90s. Um, so I did a tr very traditional route of getting into the field, which was um, through peer education. Um, so I was trained as a peer educator because peer education works. Um, and then I went into the University of Maryland College Park, where I was trained to do that with college athletes and the campus community. 
And um, I completed that degree and I went straight into a graduate program at NYU for human sexuality education. And then took a couple of years off, uh, went back for a PhD in women's studies, which I ended up receiving the master's degree. Um, and then I received the honorary doctorate um, about 15 years later. So the certifications piece comes about because the um, North American um, membership organization for sexuality educators, counselors, and therapists is called ASECT, which stands for American Association of Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, Sexuality Educator, Counselors, and Therapists. Um, and <clears throat> it's rooted here in the United States and they basically certify individuals who are doing those types of care and support work. So I've been certified for about six years now as an educator, and I've been a supervisor, which means I offer support with emerging or more seasoned educators and therapists who want to become ASEC certified. So I offer them supervision, one-on-one -on -one coaching, or also group um, environments as well. And um, so that's a certification. Certifications are expensive, <laughs> um, but it is like our national membership organization. And so at the time, you know, I knew about ASEC for decades, but it was just not the organization I wanted to pay to be in. Mm -hmm. It was very old school. It was very white. It was not very progressive. There weren't a lot of people of color represented. You know, all the things that you can imagine were happening in the early <laughs> to late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah was definitely happening. So the organization is shifting and changing, which is why I've joined and volunteered my time with the organization. Um, and then I created my own certification program through Antiup Professional Development. And what that certification does is it takes some of the most um, used and emergent frameworks that are rooted in equity and justice, like reproductive justice, like intersectionality, disability justice. Um, and I collaborate with people doing that work and create courses that feature them and their wisdom, either as co-instructors or as guest speakers. Um, and so that is how I've been trying to build up this online freedom school, which I like to call it, um, to really align with the freedom schools that were created in the US South by um, black educators during the time when there were separate and unequal laws in our country. And what they ended up doing was creating a curriculum that really fed the needs and met the needs of young black students. Um, and so I'm using that same framework to build and craft courses that I think we need to learn and understand things like ableism, things like oppression, things like what, it, what does it mean to have body autonomy? Um, and so that's what a lot of my courses address. And so right now it's about nine course, one SAR, which is a sexual attitude reassessment and intensive for professionals. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, been doing that for about three years. This is my fourth year where I'm finally, you know, I have the full course catalog that it's going to be up by next week, ideally. Um, I have everything planned out for the year. Um, so I'm really excited. It's going to be the first time that, like, I figured out what works, and I'm sticking with it and expanding. So I'm really excited for the collaborations this year that I have brewing. Um, and yeah, I have a course coming up around disability justice with Sins Invalid, and that's going to be co-facilitated with Patty Byrne and maybe Nomi Lamb, um, who are two good friends of mine. So I'm really excited to bring their brilliance um, to a larger group of people who may not always have known <laughs> what the role is of these two amazing individuals in disability justice. So that's a little bit about Annie Up and what that certification looks like, as well as my degree path and what certifications look like for me in um, these past couple of years. Yeah, wow. Are you a Virgo? <laughs> I am a Leo, but I have a ton of Virgo in my chart. It's like all Virgo after that, almost. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm half Virgo, I'm on the cusp. And I have a mother that's super triple Virgo. Wow. I did it. Yeah. <laughs> that is real intense. Very organized, folks. If you need stuff to get organized, just be friend of Virgo. It's very. It's true. <laughs> yeah. And so you were talking a little bit about this traditional um, 
Association of, of Sexuality Educators, ASECT, and it not being very diverse and not, um, is that where you, WAKSHAN, which stands for Women of Color Sexual Health Network, is that where that was dropped up? Yeah, it was. Um, and it happened now 12 years ago um, at a conference in Arizona. And at the time, I was like, I don't know. Yeah, an ASIC conference. Oh, okay. I yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, you know, I decided that I was going to go to that conference because Arizona, in my mind, meant a lot of Spanish speaking individuals. I just assumed that there would be a lot of Latino um, educators and therapists. And when I got there, that was not the case. Um, and there were really only like 19 women of color. And we always kept going to the same sessions because we had the same interests. Um, but it was really lonely. I ate lunch alone or in my room. Um, and you know, you're surrounded by people who have mentors who are introducing other people to other colleagues. And you know, it just, it's overwhelming to be by yourself. And you know, what people don't know is that I'm six feet tall <laughs> and I'm fat. So, you know, I stand out in the ways that other people may also stand out and so it's a lot to like ignore me right like to miss to walk past me like I'm really I take up space um and I remember being at the pool um and I don't remember this exact story um Mariata and Trina who are the other two co-foundresses they're the ones that have this historical memory um piece but they're like you know, we were at the pool and we all got in the pool at the same time. And that was the exact same time the other white attendees at the conference got out of the pool. And we just like found each other. And we were like, are you at the same conference? I've seen you around. And that's how Wakshin really started. It was like in this pool where we were like, let's introduce ourselves. And oh, I'm going to that session as well. Let's go to the sessions together. And finally, it got to the point where we ended up in Mariana's session, uh, where she was talking about Black women and her, dis or her master's degree work, at that time she was at Morehouse, they had a sexual health program. And, um, you know, it was in one of those moments where we were like, why are we all here? Because we're so, you know, we need this, we need to see each other and hear about our communities. But also someone was like, we should start some kind of support network for us to stay here and to do this work. Um, and so that's really how it was born after that desire to not be excluded, <laughs> the desire to have other people who would come to our sessions and support our work um, and also not be alone and create some safety that would help retain us in this field. Yeah. Um, and during that time, there was one white woman who came up to us. Her name A is Judith Reinhardt. There was one white woman uh -huh. came up to us. Uh -huh. She saw us organizing and her name is Judith Steinhardt. And you might know Judith because she helped build Columbia University's Ask Alice um, advice column. Okay. And, and she's like, I see you all organizing. My name is Judith. How can I help you? And so Judith became like our mentor that was like, let me break down ASEC and how it works. Let me tell you who the presidents are. Here are people to get in contact with. And so she yeah. really guided us for several years um, in how to navigate the space, but also in collaborating. And so I think it's really important to note that it was an older white Jewish woman who showed up for us when we needed support and didn't even know that we needed it. Um, and, you know, she was the only person who talked to me that wasn't a woman of color that day or during that time at the conference. And I think it's important. You had an in already so that you didn't have to do all unnecessary emotional and oh my goodness relational yeah. labor mm -hmm. and talk about such a great example of strategically using the power that you have yeah. to help shift what's happening at an organization yeah, yeah. And, you know I think oftentimes when we talk about liberatory work or justice-centered work sometimes we forget to you know say the names of the elders who supported us mm -hmm. but especially the elder white women who support us mm -hmm. um you know, I think it's important for us to always remind people that there are white people who have our backs, who will support us, who will, you know, strategically use what they have to support us getting to where we need to be. 
So we're really grateful to Judith for that connection. And we're still in contact with her, you know, 12 years later, not just as an organization, but as individuals as well. So we've been able to nurture our own relationship with her too. That's so yeah, so Wakshin emerged. It's <laughs> and very now cinematic over. story. I could see it that is. on Netflix, you know, mini series where you all go into the pool and it's yeah. just like amazing. Yeah. It's true. It's so true. Because <laughs> uh, the pool wasn't very big, you know, like anyways, we're at this huge conference hotel, but the pool is like very small for like the almost thousands of people that were at this conference. Um, well, the intimacy of the water and like, you know, water giving rebirth. So lovely. Exactly. Exactly. It was, it was great. Um, and so now Wakshin has been around for 12 years and, um, you know, there's a membership website and um, there's a private Facebook group. There's also a public group if people want to follow Wakshin. And when people have questions, I tell them I'm no, no longer an active foundress. Um, and so I always direct people to Marietta, who is holding a lot of the leadership there and is holding a lot of the historical memory about Wakshin's work. So they're still around, they're still doing great work. Um, I encourage people to look them up uh, if they're looking for community. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, we always say that Wakshan really inspired Kaz and I to create Dasan because I was like, this is amazing. We disabled people who do sexuality stuff need a network. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah. So, and how does that work in your coaching around, not coaching, I'm sorry, your work as a sex educator who is both disabled and of color, do you have to like choose which to rep sometimes or? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, it's interesting. So I was born non-disabled and I acquired my mom's compromised immune system. And I discovered that um, when I got a diagnosis five years ago after she had died. And um, before that time, I had really been intentional in the relationships that I was nurturing. And so one of my really good friends was Stacy Park Milburn, who died suddenly May of 2020. And, um, you know, we had been like, we were like young queer babies together. You know, she was still in North Carolina. I was in New York. Oh, um, she came to North Carolina. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, she moved from North Carolina to Berkeley. And so her um, biological family is still in North Carolina. Wow. And, um, you know, and then she was like one of my three friends that I had when I moved from New York to New Orleans to then to Oakland. And, you know, I'd followed Stacy's work for forever. We were homegirls. And so I knew her connection to Patty and Sins Invalid and the Disability Justice Framework and Principles. So when I had my diagnosis and, um, you know, I was told like, you're going to be disabled, you will get sick very easily, certain things may kill you, <laughs> like, you know, the usual <laughs> that we're told. Um, I didn't have a lot of the fear that I think many non-disabled born people may hold, mm -hmm. um, but I also uh, was already connected to disabled community. And mm -hmm. so when I needed someone to reach out to, to talk to you about precautions or to talk about you know, grief or to discuss, um, you know, dating as someone like, do I need to out myself now? Um, mm -hmm. I have people that I could reach out to and talk to about it. And so I feel like those intentional friendships helped me become um, more aware of what it means to now be disabled, to be a you know, a woman of color, to be a sex educator. And so I want to say that honestly and openly because I haven't always been doing, um, you know, disability work in my sexuality um, mm -hmm. training. And now um, that I'm guided more intentionally by disability justice principles, I can totally see the way that I was trained in a very ableist white supremacist <laughs> way of understanding the body, of understanding pleasure, of always, you know, thinking that sexual pleasure is connected to the genitals, you know, and really having a very narrow idea yeah. of sexuality for disabled people. Um, yeah. And so <clears throat> one of the big things that has been important for me is to remind my community that, oh, this is ableist. <laughs> like, oh, right. this is what ableism looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard because there are consequences to being on the side of justice. And some of those consequences 
for me have looked like hurting my friend's feelings when I told them this is ableist because right. um, they received it in a very harsh yeah. way. Because for me, I'm like, this could kill me. <laughs> like, so this is why it's ableist. Yes. You know, it, for me, the line was just very clear. Um, right. It wasn't for those individuals. And mm -hmm. so they weren't able to receive what I was saying because they expected me to come and tell them this in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, which is one of those things about like crip rage that I don't think a lot of people understand um, unless they've experienced it. And so I've been holding a lot of um, shifting friendships um, especially during the pandemic, where I think, and I believe, that a lot of the friendships that I had pre-pandemic are now shifting and changing where those individuals are becoming more of a colleague mm -hmm. than they are a friend. And that's really because, you know, people in my life are still traveling. They're still doing whatever they want to do. But that is the line, as you said a few moments ago, that you suddenly then feel with your friends. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, that's the line, because I'm like, I will die. <laughs> like, COVID will kill me. Yeah. Just Not just because I have a compromised immune system, but I'm fat. And the hospitals here are over, like, they can't yes. support anyone coming in for anything. Um, and so those are the things that have really impacted me intentionally. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, working in the Crip Camp curriculum, if people have seen the Crip Camp film, it's a great film, and it's also very white. Mm -hmm. There are no women of color who speak. There are no black women who speak. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were intentional, the producers, um, with hiring Andrea Levant and Stacey Park Milburn as the impact producers. Um, and then they were intentional about hiring myself and my co-writer, Aisha Terman, who's a black woman and parent of a disabled black child. Um, and so it was really guided by, you know, myself and my understanding of disability justice, the curriculum, and, um, and by Aisha saying, okay, this is what my experience as a parent advocating for my child has looked like. So these are parts of the historical pieces of the disability rights movement that are important for, for young people to understand. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the curriculum is amazing, in my opinion. I'm also biased. Um, <laughs> but we worked really hard to create something for educators in a variety of different settings. Is it for a variety of different mm, young adults, older adults, or is it just a general adult? Yeah, or it starts yeah. at eighth grade reading level. Okay. So, yeah, so we usually encourage people um, about middle school age for young people. Mm -hmm. um, so we have specific lesson plans that people can use throughout the semester. You don't have to do one lesson plan for the whole class. Like it's, that's not how we built it. Mm -hmm. But we also have um, a viewer guide for an educators as well as a parent guide. So if you wanna watch the film with your children mm -hmm. and help them understand the disability rights movement, we have guides as well to help them prepare and engage in conversations, um, doing activities like writing letters um, to people who are in the uh, film who are still alive. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those um, curricula where so many of us have been waiting for a curriculum yes. about disability justice. And nobody's really done one that's been published in this way. And so what really excites me is that this is one of the first times this is offered. And I'm so excited about how people are gonna use it as a model and then make it better or do something better. You know, like I love being able to say, here's one try, mm -hmm. now take what works and build something new. Yeah. That guided by DJ Disability Justice as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really excites me is how this is gonna shift and change and morph with the ways that you know, younger people, people with different disabilities are going to expand the curriculum. And that's really, that's where I get most of my joy from <laughs> is knowing that that's how it's going to be used and expanded. Yeah. And it sounds like you can even use it. So um, I have a strong disability community around me online, but in my life in Florida, I, I only know one other disabled person. Um, and it seems like you could use it to start a group, to make an intentional group to get to know people. You could use meetup.com and we're going to study this curriculum yeah. and have these conversations. So that, that sounds really lovely. Absolutely. And, you know, if people do have Netflix, they can now do like a Netflix party and, you know, yeah. it's 
subtitled and audio described in 23 different languages, but it also is free on YouTube, but it only is in English with um, subtitles as well as um, audio description. But what, one of the things that I really love about the activities is that they're also for people with various disabilities and abilities. So one of the first activities is talking about media literacy. And what is it that we're consuming when we're listening or watching or, you know, yeah. focusing in a particular way? How do we listen with our whole body? But also um, helping young people practice what it means to create an audio description, what it means to create an image description, mm -hmm. because this is where the future of technology is moving. Yeah. So, you know, my belief is if we take a seventh grader who already knows what Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and Clubhouse are, and we teach them how to create image descriptions, um, it's already gonna, be, gonna become something that they do. So it won't be such a hard shift to incorporate right. things in the future when they're yeah. doing other things. So I'm really excited just for the reality of how useful it is. Um, and also helping non-disabled people see that it doesn't need to be difficult to make a film accessible. Like we do not need like special glasses with the captions. Some people do, but at the end of the day, a lot of people like give me the captions on the screen. Like yeah. I can mean, just, yeah. let's, let's just do that in general. You mean like the Google glasses? The, um, there are some, Regal Cinema has some glasses yeah. that we use, and they also have like these, I forget what they call them, but they also have them, these like headphones for people who need like an, oh, audio. yeah, I mean, but they're also like, look, we don't know how they work, we don't know if they need batteries, they're we don't know how often they're clean, <laughs> kind of like how the captive viewer yeah. isn't always accessible either, it's heavy, it's clunky, right. it's the wrong movie, like we can imagine all the other things. Yeah. But yeah, those are some of the features that I think are really helpful for non-disabled people to think about. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, why do you think, you know, I, when I explain to folks um, that I work in disability and sexuality and that I'm an educator and that I run this membership directory to uplift disabled sex educators and make them more visible, you know, I still get a lot of, is that even a thing? <laughs> and um, it's like you say the words and then their mind goes, and then, yeah. Like, yeah. and then they have nothing to say. Right. They're like now speechless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's interesting. I, you know, I've gotten used to that and Cal's gotten used to that, but our website went live during COVID and we really you know, we were grieving because of what was happening in the world. And we were like, what are we doing? Is this frivolous? Mm -hmm. and, and this is our career and our passion. But um, because so many people with disabilities are houseless, don't have the right food they need, don't have access to leave their homes. Right. Um, and Black people are getting murdered in the street and there's riots. So we're going to talk about getting some disabled people to have sex. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are we doing? Yeah, well, I, mean, I think it's so important, though, because people need to, you know, one of the ways that we, like, focus on the grief and the shift and the change, I think, is, like, going through it and being reminded that there's a life, that this is what it feels like to be a full human being, that there's going to be great times, there's going to be really crappy times, and, you know, I feel like right now we're all having such an amazing and devastating human experience that's horrific and scary, and that there's also still pleasure in living this particular life that we may have, or also the delayed gratification of what may come in the future, and I think um, that's really important because, you know, it's a similar connection that I make for queer, pe queer people, especially queer youth, where they don't always have examples of what their future could look like. Yes. It's really difficult for them to imagine being an adult or imagine graduating high school or whatever it looks like, building a family. Um, and so leaving a little bit of examples of what it could look like to live a life in a particular way that we imagine, I think is really, really important. And it's definitely a part of, um, you know, nurturing the pleasurable aspects, which, 
you know, when people talk about sex, they always want to talk about the pleasure, which is great. And we also need to talk about like how death is also one of the main uh, guarantees of being a human being. And, you know, we're not always talking about death and grieving and how there may be pleasure, maybe some eroticism in our grief that we can lean on. So, you know, when I say that, I think about the ways that when I was grieving my mother and her death, that I really, I was single, I was alone. It was really difficult. And, um, you know, what a lot of people are talking about now, the skin hunger of not being able to have people touch you or mm -hmm. hold you or connect with you. I was really feeling that as a single person who didn't have a lot of friends around me. Um, and it made me become a lot more open and honest about what my needs were. Um, it also made me be very clear about what I didn't want and what I wasn't gonna be able to tolerate. Um, and it also allowed me to be a lot more vulnerable in a way that built more intimacy more quickly with people. Yeah. And I think, you know, I lost some friends during my grieving process because some people, think grief is like contagious or something. It, it scares um, them. They can't deal yeah, with it. Yeah. yeah. And then the people who did show up really were surprising because I didn't know that they would show up in that way. And so now I have really amazing friendships that I'm nurturing with them. And, you know, it's the friendship part is also really important as far as like pleasure. Um, yeah. And you said a minute ago to eroticize all parts of your life, even the grieving. How, how would you describe what that means for someone who's never thought to, to try to tap into that? You know, what, I, what it looked like for me, so I'll give you examples for me during that time, um, is I really was like, I need to make some rituals that will hold the, the things that I would take pride in, the things that I can find pleasure in. And so during that time, I would turn like bathing into a ritual, right? So what that meant for me was I would set aside a time where I would say, I'm definitely going to take a shower at this time. I'm going to use my special soap and scented lotion. And, you know, I made it a thing, you know, I was like, let's pretend that you're taking yourself out on a date and you're going to have some really great sexual experiences. So you want to smell the way you want to smell, feel the way you want to feel. Mm -hmm. And so really indulging in that in the shower. And what that looked like for me was, you know, every time I would clean a part of my body, I would say, oh, you have like your mother's hands, or, you know, you inherited this part of your body from an ancestor you don't know, or mm -hmm. how can we connect to, you know, the part of your body that looks like your father, like your feet, you know, so it was really this kind of ritual that I did quietly and on my own, um, and so I did that a couple times a month. I also um, would get my nails done, <laughs> so my mother loved red, she loved wearing red lipstick, red nail polish, and um, so at the one year anniversary of her death, I decided to start getting my nails done. And, you know, I just would show up at the nail salon and be like, paint whatever you want. Here are my 10 nails. Try out whatever. And I built this really great relationship with a nail artist. Oh, was, that's oh, beautiful. Yeah. And so I had these really beautiful nails. And, you know, they were, they were things that people always noticed. And so people were like, wow, your nails look great. And I would say, oh, these are my grieving nails because my mom's dead and I'm trying to take pride in my appearance <laughs> by getting my nails done. Um, it gets me out of bed. It gets me out of the house. Um, I like looking at my hands because I have my mom's hands. You know, mm -hmm. so those were some of the rituals that I would do. Um, and then another part of the ritual was I just realized like a year and a half into my grieving, I was like, okay, I've been in bed literally seven days straight. I've only gone to the bathroom um, and I'm only nibbling on certain things. And I had to see a psychiatrist. I was like, I need medication mm -hmm. to help me be functional. And, um, you know, when I talked to psychiatrists, she was like, let's put you on something for a year only. And then we'll slowly wean you off it based on how you respond to it. Huh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, antidepressant and anti-anxiety yeah. medication because I was just so anxious mm -hmm. about who else is going to leave, who else is going to die. Like I just yes. thinking about death all day long can yes. lead to some anxiety, and um, you know, and I say that because there's so much stigma around taking medication mm -hmm. for mental health things like depression. But really, Amber, like, that's what got me out of bed. Like, I can remember when that medication started to work for me. And I was like, oh, look at me cooking breakfast and scrambling an egg. And yeah, you're almost watching. I was just saying to my mom, I was like, I think this dosage has kicked in. I mean, it's just a little click. And then I'm like, oh, look at me doing this thing. <laughs> 
putting stuff yeah. away and walking yeah. the dog. Yeah. It's so real. It's so true. And, um, you know, I've been on this medication now for about three and a half years. And so I'm slowly being weaned off it mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I don't have the anxiety anymore. We'll see how I go with the depression, but I'm also really cautious just in case. Um, but also I was on one of the medications that lowers your libido. Mm -hmm. And so that's been really hard, like having a really active libido um, yeah. prior to getting on this medication and then seeing it just drop has been really devastating for me, um, but also devastating for my relationships with my partners. And, you know, I live with one of my, with my core partner, G, and mm -hmm. that's been a conversation that we have where I'm like, look, you know, mixed libidos is going to be a thing in our relationship, just period. Mm -hmm. But I also know that this medication is impacting my libido. Yes. So let's, you know, let's be really honest with my therapist and with my, med my medical provider. And mm -hmm. they have since been really great at lowering my dosage um, and just monitoring me. So, yeah, you know, I want to be honest about that because I feel like people don't ever talk openly about what it feels like, what the yeah. experience was like. Um, and I really want to destigmatize the things that help us survive and cope. Um, yeah, well, you know, you, you have that, um, the message that's transmitted to you as a disabled person that you have to be upbeat or um, empowered, you yeah. know, to, and, and, and when you think about it, that's ableist because you're, you're forcing an attitude of right. take charge. Not everybody accomplishes things that way. And so similarly, I think it's hard for disabled people to talk about the mental health stuff because yeah. they're so trained that oh, we as Crips are supposed to be upbeat and, you know, um, empowered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely a journey. And I love what you were talking about with the nails because I've dealt with grief around um, the way that disability has shaped my body and hands and caused severe pain. So mm -hmm. by getting a tattoo, on a part of my arm that's super visible. Yeah. See that. Yeah, is it a, um, a seashell? It's a nautilus. Oh, nice. It's, yeah, they're, you know, they're a fossil and I relate to fossils yeah. physically. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love but it. what's that? I said, I love it that you can. Yeah, it. just proof you can eroticize anything. Yeah, and then, Absolutely. so then this one is about the whole degeneration of my spine, mm -hmm. but it's also the chakras, because yeah. I do energy work. On yeah. My so yeah, it's an interesting way of taking over the narrative, um, especially if you're a physically disabled person that's very visibly disabled. Yeah. You, um, you know, you mark yourself. Mm -hmm. or, or you want to make... Um, what was hard visible yeah. because you own that so much, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's such an important part that crafts and shapes our lives. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, it's interesting. I was traveling last year, um, but I'm now a wheelchair user. And so when people saw me, I they didn't know that. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. So, um, you know, so I'm a wheelchair user and, you know, I'm one of those people who can stand and walk for like maybe four and a half minutes but then I just sit, you know, like, so it's been that kind of thing where I'm just like, let's just carry my wheelchair with us wherever we go. So when I go to conferences, I come, my partner comes with me and pushes the wheelchair. But then there's people who are like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that this is your life. And, you know, people, and this is where the ableism shows up, right? Where I get to see their shock and yeah. their horror. Where they're well, like, what do we do now? Right. And it's like, I'm still here, homies. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, like I'm still doing amazing work. I'm still you know, fucking stuff up and holding y'all accountable. And I'm still building community and collaborating in new ways. And, you know, when I hear people say things like disability justice saved my life, I totally know what they mean because it's interdependence that's allowed me to still do this work, to still, you know, collaborate with people, to pay people a thriving wage. I mean, all those are really important pieces that are connected to my personal values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So to be able to have a framework that also says, yes, you too are worthy, no matter how you come and show up in the world has been really, really helpful and grounding. 
um, mm -hmm. the work that I want to do and continue to do. So now a lot of my work when it comes to sexuality education and training is also incorporating with therapists who are so deeply committed to the medical model of disability, mm -hmm. um, how to shift away from it. Yeah. And, you know, how do you make decisions about where you really have to be in, a, in allegiance with that mm -hmm. versus how you don't need to have a scented candle in your office. You know, you can have chairs that don't have arms. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can yeah. find an office that has, you know, an elevator and a door that's, you know, a sliding door that's, mm -hmm. you know, automatic. And, you know, and people just don't think about this stuff very often. So I'm happy to join people like Kaz and Grayson and yourself who have really been building this work and offering another layer to it um, mm -hmm. as well, because we do that work in such unique and different ways um, that it feels really good to say, these are my community members. And if I can't meet a need, I know at least four of the people who can. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I'm really excited about Dawson and the work that y'all are doing and doing these videos. I'm excited to hear other people so share. I don't think you mentioned the Black Sweat program that you're doing. Oh, you want to no, not yet. Yeah, so um, I created a sexuality series called Black Sweat that started October 2020, and it's going until July of 2021. So can people not join now then? Um, so they can, yeah. It's a, oh. People can join, yeah. So it's every Sunday um, at 12 p.m. Pacific time, which is 3 p.m. Eastern's time. And it's an opportunity to learn from a Black sexuality educator for one hour. Um, so we have a variety of different educators who present on a variety of different topics. Um, and they get paid from the ticket sales. So part of my agreement uh, with the presenters is that I will post this on the ASEC website and calendar, that I will offer an ASEC continuing education unit so that you know racially white people can show up and come or non-Black people can show up and learn and meet Right. some emerging or more seasoned Black sexuality professionals and really build and expand their referral list. Um, and I say that because a lot of people depend on conferences in person to do the networking, but now that we're not doing those conferences in person, the networking piece isn't always there for people. So I really wanted to create an opportunity for people to say, oh, I have never heard of this person, but they're gonna be talking about Christianity and the Bible and how sexuality is there. Let me go to that session with Gwen, right? Like, and so those are some of the really exciting conversations that have been happening. Um, it's on Eventbrite. Each ticket is 25 oh my God. I, have to, I don't know what I've been doing. I need to come. <laughs> yeah, it's been really amazing. Um, I have Sonia Renee Taylor coming April oh, wow. 11th. Yeah, so I feel like that's going to sell out. There's only 100 tickets. Yes. If you're watching this and you want to hear from Sonia Renee, um, definitely get your ticket. Okay. And one of the accessibility notes um, is that we are on the Zoom platform. And if anyone needs um, ASL to just let me know two weeks in advance so that I can make sure that we can confirm that mm -hmm. with the translator. Um, and yeah, the, the pieces are not recorded because it's an hour. It's really a conversation to mm -hmm. see other people present and hear from them. But if you can't attend, I always send out the, the individual slide deck as well as any resources that they shared so that people can stay connected and follow each other. So um, it's been a really amazing experience to host that and to meet and hear from so many amazing, emergent, brilliant Black sexuality professionals. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited for what is gonna happen for the rest of the year. I think I have some really great people lined up. So whatever you're interested in, there's probably someone that's gonna talk about that topic. So yeah. if you're interested in meeting new emergent people, definitely join us. Well, um, I'm really excited because I have been listening to sexuality podcasts. I love podcasts yeah. for years. They are all white people. Um, <laughs> and they're, they feel like friends because I've listened to them so much. Um, but I'm kind of bored. I need, I need something. I need to shift that energy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because it's not the whole story, of course. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting to me. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely Great. Well, I am happy to, um, you know, say that the website, everything's up. You can register for people's sessions. It's anti-up, P-D, A-N-T-E, P-D, 
or anteupd.com um, forward slash black dash sweat. Um, you can find it there. Um, and every particular Sunday has its own link. So if there's just one or two that you want to attend, it's just a real easy way to register individually. Okay, yeah. fabulous. Well, I, I know Bianca's mentioned a lot of links and we will provide them in the transcript. Um, and I'll say one more time because probably all these are on your website, yes? Yeah, all they good. are, yeah. So Loriano, all one word, dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's where you can find, you know, we do not, not even do pronouns. What are your pronouns? <laughs> My pronouns are she, her, and doctor. Oh, uh, yeah, doctor. You can it. yeah. That's sexy. But yeah, once I got that honorary doctorate, I was like, call me doctor. You're going to work it. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. so great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I love it. And Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's see. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. That was so much fun. <laughs> that was fun. I, you know, I, I just know how to have a messy conversation. So I don't know how Kaz is going to deal with it for transcription. <laughs> but I can't be, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not a, a crime journalist. Right, right. That's not, yeah. No, it's yeah. fine. I think, you know, I think.